Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast, Matthew chapter 24. This will be our last, I, I'm pretty sure, our last episode on the Mass, the Eucharist, being another Christ. Let's get right into the scriptures, a ton of information coming your way. I, I said something last week that I was going to present, didn't get to it. I'm going to make sure I get to it today because it'll show you the violation that occurs in the presence of the Eucharist by the men who believe that it really is Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. So we bring up our picture of the Eucharist, and of course, embedded into it or stamped into it is the idle shepherd. It's not Jesus Christ. Jesus said, don't make any idols. Don't, don't make anything, carve out anything, engrave anything, stamp anything that you say is me because it's not me. I don't look like that. I do, I do really believe that the Antichrist is going to appear somehow as everybody's idea of what Jesus is supposed to look like. I could be wrong, but that's kind of what I think. 2 Corinthians 11, but I fear less by any means. And certainly the sacrifice of the mass does this. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, look at our picture, that's what that is. It is not the same Jesus that you and I worship. It is not the same Jesus that is in our Bibles. Another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit. So that spirit represented by this Eucharist, by this wheat wafer with a stamped image of the idle shepherd on it, the Holy Spirit is not present with that. It's a spirit of whoredoms. And what spirit is that? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And here again, that picture, it represents all three. And I've been saying this for years. If it is another Jesus, it will be a different spirit, and it will be another gospel. You can't, you can't take... And Jesus himself said this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom. You can't take everybody who says, I believe in Jesus Christ, I am a Christian. You can't accept the idea that everybody who says that really is. God doesn't. God judges a person not on the basis of what church they go to, what denomination they were a part of, who their pastor was, who their pope was, or the things that they did in this body. He judges no man on that. He judges people first on whether or not the blood of Christ has been, not drank, not swallowed, applied and blotted out the sins that are written in their book of offenses. Remember in the book of Revelation, John is watching the great white throne judgment in the future. And he says, I saw a book was open and there were books open. And those books were listed everybody and all of their sins. And the Bible plainly teaches us that when we are born again and Jesus accepts us, he has elected us, he has chosen us, he has forgiven all of our sins, he has blotted them out with his blood so that when the books are opened of all of our offenses, even though we've committed them, they've been blotted out. And the angel says, I find no charges against this person. And God says, enter thou in. So that's the real gospel. The fake gospel says, we have magically turned this grape juice or this wine 
into the real blood, which you've been told by the Bible not to drink it, but we're telling you if you don't drink it, you won't go to heaven. You will never, ever, ever receive the graces of God if you don't do what we tell you to do and don't believe what we tell you to believe. Now, I found a verse. I was reading through the book of Psalms and it just so adequately described exactly what's going on here. Since, since that wafer is not the real God, it's not the real Jesus, it's not the real gospel, it's not the real spirit of God, who is it? Well, every, every female spirit in the Bible points you to, especially wicked spirits, points you to Babylon, the spirit of Babylon. Every false god in the Bible sort of points you in the direction of the nature and characteristic of the Antichrist, the other Jesus. Here is Christ. Jesus said, don't believe that that is Christ. Psalm 106, 28, talking about Israel and what they did. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Now, everything, if you go back, <clears throat> and we're going to put all this together. The three watchmen that I've done so far, two back-to-back -back Pastor Mike Online episodes where I was reading from this Catholic Bible that was uh, loaned to us and I have someone now transcribing every part of that for me and their their description to a Catholic of what the Mass is all about. We have plainly discovered in all of that that none of that has anything to do with the real gospel, the real spirit of Christ, or the real Jesus himself. And that it is a sacrifice of the dead. Okay? So they take that, they, they say, we've turned it into Jesus, and now we're going to kill it all over again. The, and from their own words, re-sacrifice Jesus Christ, which we've already found from the Bible, Christ isn't offered up often the way the priests did either in the Old Testament or the priests do now, not just in the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, uh, United Churches of Christ, uh, Anglican Church, Presbyterian Church, some of them, um, the, uh, uh, what's the Anglican Church in America? I forgot it, but you understand what I'm saying. All these mainline denominations that use a liturgy in some form, some fashion, whether it's transubstantiation or consubstantiation, they're killing and offering up the dead Jesus all over again. And Jesus said, was it once enough? And I've asked this question, for your sins, how many times does Jesus have to die for your sins? According to the Bible, only once. According to the Catholic Church, practically every time you do something wrong. So they join themselves also unto Baal Peor. So think about what that means. And since we've discovered by the Vatican's own words that their whole church, their foundation doctrine is built upon what that Eucharist turns into and what you must do to gain their version of eternal life. You must believe that they can turn that into Jesus and you must eat and drink him in order to be saved. Thus, you join yourself in with the entirety of the Catholic Church. And it doesn't matter what they do, doesn't matter what else they believe in. Once you eat that mass, it can be repented of. Thousands of people throughout time and history have repented of being Roman Catholic and turned to the real, including some priests and nuns who were on, people who knew what was going on. They've repented and come out. But once you eat that, you join yourself in with their deeds and everything they are. You join yourself like Israel unto Baal Peor, eat the sacrifices of the dead. Now, there was something that just kept jumping out at me. 
as I was reading in that Catholic Bible, that, that literature in there about the Mass, and I know that I've heard it before, but it just never clicked until I'm reading it, and I kept reading over and over and over again. I've got some quotes here from that very article, so you know where it came from. They kept talking about the unbloody sacrifice. Unbloody, unbloody, un the bloodless sacrifice. And then it dawned on me, that doesn't agree with the Bible. Follow this now. According to them, you must eat this to receive God's grace. Now, you're going to find out that they're double speaking here. They're double talking. They're saying one thing one minute and then saying something the opposite another minute. You're going to see it. They contradict themselves. And that's what happens when you have a double-minded man. He's unstable in his, all, of his, all of his ways, the Bible says. He'll contradict himself, and their doctrine does. I'll show it to you in a minute. They keep talking about this bloodless sacrifice. And if you don't eat this, you cannot go to heaven. What does the Bible say about sacrifices without blood. What does the Bible say? First, let me show you what quotes I'm referring to. This again is from that Catholic Bible and that article on the Mass. Out of his boundless love for mankind, Christ empowered his apostles and their successors, which is not true, to repeat the unbloody sacrifice he offered at the Last Supper. Moreover, in making the offering of Christ's life to God the Father, we are making present again the sacrifice of Calvary. See it? They're admitting that they are re-sacrificing what happened at Calvary. We are making present again the sacrifice of Calvary through which all grace was merited for us. All grace through the Mass. With the eyes of faith, we see the death of Christ made present again on the altar in an unbloody manner each time the Mass is celebrated. Now, that's twice now that they've said and repeated unbloody sacrifice, unbloody manner in which he was sacrificed again. So they admit, I, I got another one. The solemn moment is here. In other words, this pertains to the Eucharistic prayer. The priest is now said, let's see if I can remember this, um, hoc est corpus meum. Hoc est corpus meum. Hocus pocus. Poof. They should have like smoke. Poof. Now, because that's, you know, in magic, that's when stuff changes. A hat, a hat turns into a rabbit. Poof. They should add, I'm telling you, it would be cool if they added smoke. Hocus pocus, turn the wafer into Christ. And you're going, well, it doesn't look any different. It'd be like if I said, I'm a magician. I'm going to turn this pen into a rattlesnake. Hocus pocus. And I went, poof, smoke. And you're looking at it, you're going, still a pin. It's, and I'd say, no, it's a rattlesnake. And you're going, no, it's a pin. I said it's a rattlesnake, and if you don't believe it's a rattlesnake, you're not going to heaven. Okay, it's a rattlesnake. <whistles> That's exactly, that is exactly what happens in the Mass. They tell you it's Jesus, you know it's still a wheat wafer. The solemn moment is here. Christ, as the eternal high priest, will renew in a bloodless manner his death upon the cross. Now, now the first sacrifice, the only sacrifice that Christ made, was not a bloodless sacrifice. Do you remember? They pierced him. The sword was driven into his side, I believe, here, piercing the pericardium, 
which was full of water, the heart full of blood, and the Bible says blood and water issued forth. His truly was a bloody sacrifice. But according to the Catholic Church, now every Mass that has been said since that time has zero blood. There's no blood. It is a bloodless, bloodless, as the eternal high priest will renew in a bloodless manner his death upon the cross. So now three times this one place, and you look this up. You just go to your favorite search engine, go to Wikipedia, go to the Catholic Encyclopedia, and do a search for bloodless sacrifice. And you'll see from the Vatican's own words, their own doctrine. If you want to read it in Latin, read it in Latin. It's going to say the same thing. Unbloody or bloodless sacrifice. And according to the Bible, that accomplishes nothing. You see, I had a controversy come before me in the presence of a former pastor of this church who had left and he went on to teach in a seminary and he concocted this article that said that in the Bible Christ's blood was not really what saves us, that it was his death that the anytime you saw the word blood in the Bible that was his word was a metonym which is like a metaphor and synonym mashed together a metaphor married a synonym and had a metonym as a child meaning that when the Bible says blood it doesn't really mean blood it simply means death and the first time somebody sent me the article I didn't read it because I thought well I know that guy He's probably, there's, there's probably some heresy going on out there and he's clearing it up for all of us. Way to go! And then I was told by somebody else what he actually said and I went back and read it and I was furious. This man claimed that Christ's blood was no different than his sweat, his spit, any other bodily fluid that he had. You know what he's getting at, right? And that hurt my feelings, because I knew this guy. I was thinking about having him come and preach him, and I went, he'll never preach here. Unless he repents of that, I'll never have him behind my pulpit. And as far as I'm concerned, people, you can't trample on the blood of Jesus Christ, nor its doctrine. Let's look in the scriptures, Romans 5. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. How are we justified? According to Roman, let's see, the, who was that? The Apostle Paul? I would say the Apostle Paul knows more than any priest about what the true doctrines are. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justified how? By his blood. Ephesians 1 7. In whom we have redemption. How? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh, how? By the blood of Christ. Colossians 1.14 In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.20 You see, I'm going in biblical order from Romans all through, you can search this out if you want to. Search for blood in the New Testament. Colossians 1.20, having made peace, how? Through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There is no reconciliation without the blood of his cross. So in the Catholic church, church's version 
the one-time cross sacrifice of Christ is not sufficient to save you. It takes a constant re-killing in an unbloody manner of the same Jesus. And it's anathema. It's accursed. It angers me because the one sacrifice that we know Christ did was so painful, so ag- we covered this when we found out what crucifixion actually is. It is nine hour strangulation. It's giving a person barely enough air to keep alive while they are in agony for hours. And then finally breaking their legs so that they just suffocate to death. But when they got to Jesus, they didn't have to. Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Hebrews 9.13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You know what he's teaching here? Hebrews Hebrews is an excellent book. And it was written with the Hebrews name on it so the Jews would know that this is directed at them. And their Old Testament thinking that the blood of bulls and of goats atone for their sins. All they had to do is kill it, shed the blood, sprinkle the blood, go through the ritual, and they're fine. But God now is removing the veil and unsealing the mystery and letting them know that never forgave your sins. It was Christ. It's always been Christ. And by the way, the Bible says he was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, how that occurs, I don't know. I just believe the Bible. And so, God is telling us in no uncertain terms that that blood of bulls and goats could not wash away man's sins. And it could not, it could maybe wash the flesh, but it couldn't clear the conscience because we know we still did some pretty rotten, nasty, dirty things, didn't we? Things we don't want to talk about, things we don't want to be reminded of. I heard a good quote from a guy the other day. He said, I've talked to a lot of soldiers, people that have been in wars, like World War II, and as valiant as World War II was and as righteous the cause, nobody in World War II really likes to talk about the people they killed because they took another man's life, a man that had a family like they did. And yeah, their cause was righteous. They don't like to talk about it because you took a man's life. Okay, things we don't like to talk about that's in our past. And once we're truly saved, it's the blood of Christ and the word of God as water that baptizes us. Peter said this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. He said, baptism doth even save us, not the putting off the filth of flesh, but the answer of a new conscience. You can have somebody wash the outside of you and say you're clean, but inside you know you did what you did. At least when you're saved, you know that they have been forgiven by God and you have a clean conscience now before God. That's the difference. And if without blood, and go back to my series on the blood. Go look it up. Because you understand then the white blood cells. You think, well, how does red blood make something white? It's not the red blood cells. They have a different purpose. It's the white blood cells. White blood cells. What color are they? White. They're called leukocytes because that's the Greek word for white. And white takes any uncleanness in our body. The white blood cells take any uncleanness in our body, break it up into billions of pieces, consume it, envelop it, and then when they're done with it, they die. And then it's as if that uncleanness or infection was never there to begin with. 
that only the blood can do. So you poor Catholics going into that Catholic church in an unbloodless mass, it's why you find no peace. You still know the dirty, evil things you did. And you want your conscience cleared, but it won't be cleared without the blood. Again, Hebrews 9.13, If the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9.18, Where, Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Let me read that again. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. According to the Bible, they can keep doing masses until all the cows come home. And because it's an unbloody mass, there can be no remission of sins. And the Catholic Church says this is the only thing that can remit your sins. This, the Mass, is what gives the priest power to say to you, absolve, whatever, hocus pocus, I remit all your sins. And you think you've got them forgiven. But you didn't confess to God, you confessed to a man who, who stopped you and said, uh, you can't go to God, you have to come to me. And then you read this Bible and you find out that you can with boldness go directly to God through Jesus Christ, the throne of grace, and find help and mercy in time of need. Not from a man, an unmarried man, that tells you that he never lusts after anybody. You don't believe that, do you? It's because he doesn't practice it. Now, I mentioned uh, throughout this that because the Catholic Church has veered so far away from the Bible. You know, Peter said, you know, when we gave you the gospel, we didn't give you curiously devised fables. We haven't followed fables. We didn't learn superstitions and old wives' tales and, you know, traditions like, you know, oh, look, here is mistletoe. You better kiss me for luck. Does that really do anything? Does that really give people luck? No, it's just an excuse to get some kiss from somebody, okay? Or worse. But we have all these, uh, oh, a black cat crossed my way. I better cross myself three times or I'll have bad luck for seven years. Don't walk underneath the ladder. That's unlucky, okay? Horseshoes hanging on the wall that are pointed up because they're lucky, but if the horseshoes falling down, then all the luck runs out of it. As if a horseshoe holds like gallons of luck juice in it. And oh, look, you spilled the luck juice all over the floor. See, that's superstitious, right? Well, I picked this up the first time I ever watched Catholic Mass. I was at a funeral in a Catholic church. And I didn't know what, I'd never studied the Mass. And I'm watching this priest, and he's you know, pours the wine in, adds a little water. I'm going, what's up with that? And he puts a, a card over the top of the cup. Why did he do that? And then, you know, the, they bring the, the bowl out or a plate or a platter, you know, with the Eucharist on it, the wafer, and it's covered up. He uncovers it and he holds it up. And when he breaks it, First, he takes a little piece and breaks it off and puts it into the cup. And then puts the cover back on. Can't let none of that escape out because that's blood of Jesus. 
and he, you know, he'll either break the wafer over the, directly over the open cup or break the wafer over the card. And then I, in this particular case, the priest took the card and immediately folded it and dumped the contents, any crumbs, down into the, the cup. And it dawned on me, because I knew that they believed that that turns to Jesus. And I'm going, why is he doing that? Ah. Because he believes that cup has been turned into the blood, and that wheat wafer has been turned into the real body, I bet they believe that we can't have Jesus crumbs just laying on the table or God forbid they should end up on the floor and somebody walk on it or it be sucked up in the church vacuum cleaner. We can't have that. So we have to be really careful now when we break that wafer that every little crumb falls into the cup because the priest is going to drink all of that so that it's not waste. So we can't have pieces of the body or blood of Jesus floating around in the air or falling down on the carpet or, God forbid, end up on anybody's clothes. You see, there's part of, the, part of every Mass, and I watched several of them online, you can too. You'll see the exact same thing. And it, I actually read it in that article on the Mass. Before the priest handles the wafer, he has water poured onto his fingertips, a ritual called the lavabo. Now, lavabo is a word that's where we get the word lavatory. Lavatory is means to wash your hands or wash something. There was a laver, yes, the priest had to wash in water. There was a laver, a bronze laver, before he could go into the sanctuary, the holy place or the temple or the tabernacle. He had to wash, okay? Those carnal washings, again, Hebrews tells us that they're only a shadow, a figure of Christ washing us with his blood and the water of his word, baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? Cleaned by the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. So, and you watch, the priest, only these two fingers, because it's only these fingers here that he's going to touch the Eucharist with. So he holds his fingers, and the little altar boy <clears throat> pours water over his fingers. Now the priest, and according to that article, now that has cleansed the entire priest. The priest, from the top of his head down to his dirty socks, is now completely 100% bona fide soap clean from any defilement whatsoever and from any sin because those two fingers were washed. This washing of the fingers denotes the cleanness and purity of soul with which these divine mysteries are to be celebrated, which ought to be such as not only to wash away all outer filth, but even the dust which sticks to the tips of our fingers, by which are signified the smallest faults and imperfections. See, I didn't make this up. After the communion, the priest takes first a little wine into the chalice, which is called the first ablution, in order to consummate what remains of the consecrated species in the chalice. Species is the host, the wafer. And then takes a little wine with water, which is called the second ablution, upon his fingers over the chalice, to the end that no particle of the blessed sacrament may remain adhering to his fingers, but that all may be washed into the chalice and so received. In other words, the wafer should not be touched by defiled hands. So, superstition. And I just read, exact, you thought I'm poking fun at them, and in the kind of way I am, because it's silly. It's silly to think this stuff. Um, to the end that no particle of the blessed sacrament may remain. Now, you got to think about this. Think this through. 
We learned in school that the smallest unit of matter was the atom. If you've ever seen like slow motion, close up picture of someone breaking a cracker, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Slow mo breaking cracker. I'm sure there's gotta be a video. You'll see that the cracker never breaks it's brittle. It never breaks cleanly. Little pieces of it that can't even be seen with the eye fly out into the air. Now, how small a piece counts as the body of Christ? Because now we know that it's not the atom that's the smallest particle of mass in the universe. Atoms are made of electrons, neutrons, protons, and those electrons, neutrons, and protons are made up of quantum particles, even smaller than that, whose fundamental physics defy the laws of atomic physics. Weird stuff. So in all of their superstitions, it's all just a show. Again, they said to the end that no particle of the blessed sacrament may remain. And yet, as soon as he broke that, minute microscopic particles went flying off. And now you have, according to them, pieces of Jesus polluted into the world. Sound about right? Can any amount of water washing actually and virtually remove all filth from your skin? We've seen skin close up. There's little particles of dirt, matter from the air, skin mites that can't even be felt that live literally on the surface of our skin, eating up dead skin cells. And I'm pretty sure then those skin mites would have eaten the body of Jesus Christ. So will there be skin mites in heaven now? Great big ones? See, you're saying, you're being silly. The whole superstition is silly. The whole thing is, it doesn't match the scriptures. Mark 7, Jesus dealt with this whole washing of the hands issue. The Pharisees, believe it or not, believed the same thing in a slightly different way. And Jesus then pointed out just how ridiculous they were. Mark 7, verse 1, Then came together unto him the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes. See, these are the religious men in robes. Get it? Which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, unwashed hands, they found fault. Now, can I admit something about me? Nine times out of ten, I'm going to eat without washing my hands first. And believe it or not, even when I worked in construction, after working all morning and it came time for me to eat lunch, I'd go, that's clean enough. And I'd eat my sandwich, my chips, my little Debbie snack cake, eat it. I wouldn't wash my hands. Didn't care. I'm still alive. I don't remember vomiting up because I didn't wash my hands. Anyway, they found fault. They said, we watched your disciples. They ate bread without washing their hands. That's a violation of the Talmud and our forefathers and their traditions. They got indignant. They were looking to accuse Jesus of sin so they could kill him. 
For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, oft eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. In other words, they're saying, the Pharisees were full of these, wash this, wash this, wash this, wash this, wash this, wash this tradition. Full of it. Now, verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thou thy disciples according to, look at this, the tradition of the elders. Stop right here. Not the letter of the law. The tradition of the elders. Same thing you got in the Catholic Church. It's not in the Bible anywhere that the priest must wash his hands, he must wash his fingers, and that represents washing his whole body, and he can't do this without, you know, over the cup, and that is nowhere in the Bible. Where did it come from? Catholic tradition. The tradition of the popes and the cardinals and what they said over the last 1,700 years. That's where it all came. It all came from the tradition of the Catholic Church. Not one thing of the Mass comes from the Bible. The Pharisees, scribes, asked him, Why walk thou, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How being in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And that's my charge against Pope Francis, every cardinal, every priest, and every Catholic. It's my charge against the lot of you is that you have actually made the Bible of none effect and worthless because you've accepted the tradition. Show me, show me anywhere in the pages, Matthew to Revelation, Genesis to Malachi, anywhere where there's a confessional hut where you have to go to a priest to confess your sins. Show it to me. Show me where it says Mary was born without original sin. Show it to me where Mary receives our prayers. Show it to me where there's even to be a pope, apostolic succession. According to the book of Acts, the apostles were only men who had walked with Jesus when he was on this earth and were witnesses of his death and resurrection. Matthias was, that's why he was qualified to be chosen as an apostle. After that, there are no apostles. You show me, you show me 98% Catholic doctrine. Show it to me in the Bible not there. They piled it on like the Jews did. You could say that the Catholic Church is the new Judaism, but the place is already taken by Judaism because it's still around. But the Catholic Church is following the, in the exact same way as the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish scholars, the scribes, and the Pharisees. Same deadly, hellish religion. I mean, after all, you've seen the video, right, of the priest offering the bride. The bride is all dressed in her wedding gown, a little low cut here, you know, and the priest is going to give her communion, and oops, he drops the wafer down into her dress. Well, she goes after it, and he swats her hand away, reaches his hand down there where her things are, and pulls I would never do that. Do you know why? Superstition. 
Because the, according to their dogma, the priest is the only one who has the clean hands to be able to touch the body of Jesus. After all, that's what it is. It's not just a wheat cracker. It's the body of Christ, and the priest is the only one. How dare this woman stick her hand down there where her parts are and touch that wafer, Jesus? How dare she touch that with unwashing hands? That's what gave that priest the right. And I'm sure he wasn't going, Now, I'm not lusting in one way at all. Where is it? In fact, let's talk about these traditions. Here's another one called the sacristy. I didn't know there was such a place as a sacristy. I didn't know there were no such place until I heard about a Catholic cardinal, third most powerful man in the entire Catholic Church. Let me explain the sacristy. It is the place where, um, here's a picture of it, where the priest before the Mass, puts his holy robes on. They've been arranged, they're hung for him, they've been washed, they've been ironed, they're holy. I don't know if any ritual goes into blessing the robes, I don't know. But once he puts them on, he's holy man. He walks out of the sacristy directly to the stage to perform the hocus pocus, turn the wafer into the body of Christ. Now, remember those pieces of the wheat wafer. So, there is, an, there is an allowance. You know, I said they just fly off in the air. Well, they have that partly covered. There is an allowance. Once the priest does this and washes his fingers and, then, and drinks it, there is a possibility that a piece of the body of Christ could be stuck to his sleeve or maybe you know in the front of his robe or his pallium or you know his Dagon fish hat could be stuck anywhere to him well what am I gonna I got Jesus on my arm here what am I gonna do so they made up you're not gonna find this in the Bible anywhere they made up a room called the sac the sacre from sacristy comes from the word sacred the holy room. And so the priest then goes directly from the stage to the sacristy, takes off his robe in that special room because it's like a containment room in a, in a lab. They have special things, special protocols there for decontaminating something so that any particle is contained in that special place. They have a, a drain, but it doesn't drain into the sewage. You can't have microbes going out into the air, you know, like China does all the time. So he goes in there and he disrobes. Then whoever comes in there and when they do their cleaning, take the robes, they wash them there because the water from the sacristy room does not go into the sewer the where, where the toilets and the sink water goes. The city sewer, the county sewer doesn't go into the sewage. It goes directly into the ground because you can put the body of Jesus in the ground. Now, here's how I found out about all that. That guy, George Pell, remember, he's the third most powerful man in the Vatican. That means he's got powers that most mortal men don't. One morning, George Pell, Cardinal George Pell, third most powerful man, did a uh, Sunday morning Mass at St. Pat Patrick's Cathedral in Australia. That's where he's from. 
The choir boys sang. The choir master led the boys out to the boys, got out of the line and went into the sacristy because that's where they store the wine. And they went into the sacristy to drink wine. Twelve, twelve-year-old boys. They call them the castrato because back when I was 11, I sang in a boys' choir. I sang uh, Bach's St. Matthew's Passion. There's a boys' choir part in there, and I got selected, a, a countywide thing, because I had that girly voice. I was real high, okay? So these two boys, prepubescent, go into that room to drink wine. George Pell walks in with his robes on sees those two boys in there. And see, I get this. I didn't just read some anti-Catholic extremist website. You look it up. <clears throat> I listened to the judge of his case go into the details of why he sentenced him to prison. And everything that I know about what George Pell did in that room, I listened from the judge's own mouth. He read word for word. You find it on YouTube and you listen to it. Don't listen to it with kids in the room. And as soon as George Pell sees the boys, immediately his first reaction, he starts reaching under his robes and says to the boys, you boys are in big trouble. That's his first response. What does that tell you? He's done this before. He molested those two boys in the sacristy with his Jesus robes on and then told them to keep their mouth shut or they'd lose. See, they got a scholarship because they could sing they got a scholarship to go to that special, very expensive Catholic school. And he told them, you keep your mouth shut or I'll have you thrown out of this school. Several years down the road, the boys grew up. They tell their story. Police arrest George Pell. They hold his trial by a jury of his peers and they sentenced him on every count they had against him. They found him guilty of every one of them. And you know how, I, how, how you can sort of tell if a guy is really guilty or not? Because the judge said that Pell's lawyers, one of them, offered up an insanity defense at one point during maybe the negotiations a temporary insanity one. You know what that means, don't you? A lawyer saying, okay, looks like he did it. Let's say that because of his age, he kind of went senile for a while and didn't know what he was doing. Therefore, he can't be held accountable because he didn't understand right and wrong because he's temporarily senile. The judge answered that issue in reading off the whole case. I got it from the judge. So apparently during the course of negotiations, at least one of his lawyers saying, okay, we see that the evidence is here. Maybe he did it, but maybe he was insane for a little while. And the judge said, this whole thing lasted 15 minutes. And then immediately after that, he is conversing with other people and he is in his right mind. The judge rejected any notion that he was senile for 15 minutes. They found him guilty, throw him in jail. Go, of course, naturally, the lawyers, he's the third most powerful man. Lawyers go to the appellate court. The appellate court, three to one or two to one, says he's guilty. We're looking at the evidence. We're looking at, we hear your uh, arguments, he's guilty. Then it goes to the Australian Supreme Court. 
nine to nothing. He didn't do this. Not five to four. Liberals versus conservatives. Nine to nothing. N not nine to nothing. Um, the judge broke one of the rules in, in the trial. You can have a new trial. Nine to nothing. He never did this. Third most powerful man didn't get to that position without being able to avoid landmines. The fact that his first response in going into the room, finding the two boys there, immediately, they said immediately he's reaching under his robe. The fact that that was his first instinct tells you he saw a moment where he could get away with it again. He had done this, but he was, he didn't try to, and the judge said this, the judge said he did not groom these boys over time. They said they'd never even met him up front before. He didn't groom them. He didn't work them. He didn't talk to them for a while. Hey, boys, you ever play catch? Hey, boys, you ever, you ever, seen, a, you ever seen a priest robes? Hey, boys, you ever seen, look, at I got some gold. You want to see, hey, boys, you want to look at this? And then he starts, no, he immediately, in the, in the amount of like 12 to 15 minutes, boom. And the kids are begging him to stop. So, back to the superstition part. Does George Pell really believe that he's got holy Jesus stuck on his clothes and he doesn't want to violate that? Well, you be the judge. Um, there's others. They call them Eucharistic miracles. Here's one, Lanciano, Italy from 700 AD. That's like, what, 1300 years ago? And according to them, the Eucharist actually turned into flesh and blood, and they've got it in, encased in glass, and it, it really is flesh and blood, and it really was a Eucharist. That was 1,300 years ago. They promise it is, and people go to Lanciano, Italy, to pray and kiss and adore this piece of, I don't know, chicken liver, something. Same thing, Santorin, Portugal, 13th century, over 100 Eucharistic miracles have occurred there where Eucharistic miracles are where the, the wine or the wheat wafer magically really does turn, all of a sudden there's a piece of meat there. And they go, Lord have mercy, look here. We got us a real piece of Jesus right here. Look at this. And everybody falls down and worships and prays and cries and oh, see they have to, See, the, the mind tells these people it's wheat. It's a wheat thin. It's a piece of dried, crusty, stale bread. Their mind tells them that. So the Catholic Church has to come up with miracles. Now, I don't know if that stuff really happened or not. Here's another one. This lady here. And I bet you, I just bet you, this lady is bucking for sainthood. I just bet you she is. Or, she's got some pretty powerful devils surrounding her. Her name is Julia Kim. She is from Korea. And she was actually at, she got invited to the Vatican because she has a history of Eucharistic miracles. So on February 28, 2010, at the Vatican, for the exactly the 33rd time, the Catholic Church says that while she took the wheat wafer into her mouth, the consecrated host, all of a sudden she opens her mouth and there's a round piece of meat in her mouth. Right? It did turn into the body of Christ. And look at it in her mouth. 
you know, I can make my thumb disappear. I can make a coin disappear. I can make something reappear. And I'm not a magician. I just know like four tricks. That's it. You've seen psychic surgeons, don't you? Haven't you? Like in the Philippines, where, in the East, where she's from. Psychic surgeons, and all of a sudden they start pulling on the belly skin, and all of a sudden blood starts pouring out everywhere. And people are going, oh my goodness, he opened her skin with just his fingers. And then all of a sudden he's pulling out some piece of corrupt meat out of there, and that's her cancer. And yeah, and he wipes it all down, and there's not even a scar. And everybody's like, and I've watched them do it. They got a fake thumb, old magician's trick. Fake thumb, piece of bacon, and some chicken blood. And all you got to do is, while you're doing this, pull that thumb out, let the blood shoot out, and then all of a sudden pull that old bloody bacon out, put it out. Nobody's going to go, nobody's going to touch it. And then what, put the thumb back on, wipe her all off, and all of a sudden, and people, people will pay their life savings to have that done as if some guy's doing surgery on her, but he's not really, he's just faking her out. I'm telling you, she's bucking for sainthood. She's pushing for it. Okay? Because, and you can watch, uh, according to the video that I saw, she's had the stigmata, wounds in her hands, all of a sudden just pop on, and I will say, one event that she turned up to, uh, she collapses, and they look at her, and she's got bloody stripes all over her legs. I mean, fresh striped wounds all over the back of her legs. Now, I don't know if she, if her husband, her old man did that to her, beat her up, you know, he's a drunk, and she just claims that that's Jesus, holds it together until she collapses. I don't know. Either she's faking or she's got some really power. Because I do believe devils can leave marks on a person. We know the devil has power over certain people's bodies. That's apparent with Job. So it could be possible that she eats a wheat wafer and all of a sudden she's got a hunk of round meat in her mouth. It's either her or it's the devil. But it's not God. It's not. Now, I'm going to show you very quickly the spillover that has happened from the Catholic Church. Remember, they infiltrate. And they say, the Protestants are too far away from us, so why don't we muddy the waters so that the Protestant churches are now doing what we do, only they don't think they're doing it. Okay, you see what I'm getting at? Let me show you this. From this article, this is from the Catholic Catechism for Adults, the Mass is a holy meal. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'll read, uh, Thus the Mass is a sacred banquet that culminates in the reception of Holy Communion. The Church urges us to prepare conscientiously for this moment. We should be in the state of grace. Now, hold on. If you're already in the state of grace, God's grace, then why do you need something else? else added to it, like the communion, the Eucharist. If you can bring yourself into a state of God's grace, why do you need to eat the Mass to put you in a further state of grace? What, grace is grace. See, it's double speak. They say one thing, then they say another. The church urges us to prepare conscientiously for this moment we should be in a state of grace and if we are conscious of a grave or serious sin we must receive the sacrament of penance before receiving Holy Communion so they say Holy Communion makes you so you can go to heaven but then you've got to have the forgiveness of your sins to receive the salvation to go to heaven they're telling you they're double speaking according to the Bible you confess your sins to God you receive the grace of God, you're saved. You're going. Okay? They're double, they're double talking. You must have this Eucharist before you go to heaven. And you must have it to have the forgiveness of sins. But then they tell you, you can't have the forgiveness of sins unless you go and do penance and confess to the priest. The sacrament of penance. 
crazy. Uh, we, all, we are also expected to fast from food or drink for at least one hour prior to the reception of Holy Communion. What verse does that come from? That before you eat the communion, you must at least an hour have an empty stomach. You can't have eaten before you go to church. Where is that anywhere? It's not. Now, let me read this. Holy communion increases our union with Christ. Hmm. So, you're partly united by doing other things in the church, but not totally. Holy communion increases our union with Christ. Just as bodily food sustains our physical life, so Holy Communion nourishes our spiritual life. This communion moves us away from sin, strengthening our moral resolve to avoid evil and turn over more powerfully toward God. The more we share the life of Christ and progress in His friendship, the more difficult it is to break away from Him by mortal sin. And that CCC is the Catholic Catechism number that they just quoted from. Number one, so Holy Communion nourishes our spiritual life. But it's carnal meat and carnal drink. In other words, you didn't drink it with your soul. You ate it with your body. So they're saying a contradiction. Just as phys bodily food sustains our body, this meal, even though it's still eaten with the same mouth you ate biscuits or cookies with, or barbecue chicken, or whatever you like, McDonald's on the way to church, whatever. It's the same way, and it's the same food. If you had wheat bread, or you had flat bread on your way to church, that's the same unleavened bread as what you ate at the church. And yet, they're telling you that this bread, because the priest said these words, now is a spiritual nourishment. No, the Word of God is. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God is the words that Jesus said. And God said it back in the book of Deuteronomy, which is where Jesus got it from. So which are you going to believe? You're going to believe what Jesus said, or you're going to believe the traditions of the Catholic Church. But it's not just the Catholic Church. This is now into, you can say Protestant, uh, just say non-Catholic Christian churches and ministries. See, anywhere where, anywhere where you spot works, salvation, or works-based blessings, you have another gospel. And if you have another gospel, you have another Jesus, and you have another spirit. Here is Sid Roth, who is... Most every show he puts out is some blasphemous, miracle-based, supernatural something that just destroys Bible doctrine. This one, this article is on his website, Healing Through Communion. Although the Lord has many ways of healing, surely one of the most precious comes from observance of communion. Through communion... People have been healed of cancer, diabetes, Epstein-Barr virus, and more. Recently, Sid Roth interviewed Dr. John Miller, a chiropractor who has studied the power of communion to heal for more than 20 years. Dr. Miller said, communion is a powerful source of healing that has been overlooked by the church. The reason why we overlooked it is that God never said it to begin with. He never said that in eating the communion, you're going to have healing of all your diseases. He never said it one time. That's why we overlooked it, Sid. We did what all of us non-Catholics are supposed to do. Overlook silly superstitions and old wives' tales and blatant false doctrine, and we just believe what the Bible says. Again, Dr. Miller said, Com communion is a powerful source of healing that has been overlooked by the church. Now, we find this article was written by a lady on Sid Roth's staff. Dr. Miller said, if we take communion on a regular basis, daily, or even several times a day, 
In other words, more is better, right? We can take it believing in progressive healing. This, stop right here. Let me give you some advice. Never accept medical advice from someone who is not a trusted physician. Never do it. This is good for people who just do not have the faith to receive immediate total healing. Oh, that's how it works. And it builds their faith because they can see small progressive improvements. The important thing is to take communion in faith, recognizing signs of improvement. In other words, really all you're doing is just believing that you don't have stage four cancer. And if you can convince yourself enough that you don't have stage four cancer, then your belief in that will cause the cancer to go away. One young lady was brought to me who was dying from Epstein-Barr virus. The virus has destroyed 39% of her liver. And she was very ill. She began taking communion three times a day, discerning the Lord's body, broken for her healing. A year later, she was in perfect health with no trace of the virus in her blood. I myself was healed of chronic headaches, which had developed from a head injury. Every day I took a large hunk of bread and chewed it bite by bite, meditating on the mystery of exchanging my sickness with Jesus' wholeness because all my de diseases were placed on him. He paid the price for my wholeness. Faith is the key to unlocking all the promises of God. Jesus said, what things soever you desire, believe you receive them and you shall have them. If we take communion in faith, then we enter not only into forgiveness of sin, but also healing of our body. During the radio interview, Sid commented, this is a powerful teaching. From now on, I will be taking communion every day, eating the bread slowly while meditating on the awesome love of the Messiah. We are free from all curses through the Messiah. Discerning his body broken for us is one of the most precious ways we have of expressing that faith. And you know what I'm thinking as I'm reading this? Is that quite possibly one of you is going to go out and start doing this, thinking, oh, that's, that's what's going to heal me. That's what's going to keep me from, you know, my pornography. If I eat communion, every time I, had, I start wanting pornography or wanting a drink or wanting drugs, then slowly but surely, that's going to wash all that away. Did you read that anywhere in here? Didn't you understand that it's by grace through faith and that not of ourselves? It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do I not believe God heals? Of course I do. I've known people that has happened to. But does God have to heal every time we get sick or we're really not loved by him? No. No. Bible doesn't say that either. See, your biggest infirmity, your biggest disease is sin. It's not your cancer, it's not your emphysema, it's not your diabetes, it's not your back aches. Your biggest sin, your biggest infirmity is your sin. And God will either make you healthy or he'll let you be sick so that you rely on him every day. But see, what they're telling you to do Number one, is unbiblical. Number two, it blasts me at best. Number three, it's superstitious. You're receiving medical advice from someone who's not a physician. And they're, te see, this is dangerous. This is so dangerous. And if I was this woman, I'd get me some good lawyers because she got a lawsuit coming. The woman who wrote this article she's telling you that for any disease that you have don't go to doctors don't take medicines don't trust any of that no treatments don't have surgery nothing just eat communion more now when you do that and it doesn't work then all she has to do is what happened to my friend Mike Marx's friend the guy who used to be Joyce Meyer's radio announcer his friend lost his business, lost his wife, lost his house, lost his health, lost everything, but was told by Joyce and his pastor that he wasn't faithful enough, and that's why God took all that stuff. Obviously, he wasn't doing something right. It's all, his, it's all about his fault, and God can't love him 
and do anything for him because he doesn't have enough faith. That's baloney. That's as fake as that hunk of meat that that lady had in her mouth. See, it's in the church. Romans 11, 5. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I must work this work. Eat this, eat this, eat this, eat this. And then I'll be healed. And then believe that it's by grace. Because it's not. It's by you, what you did. How, and how often you did it. And if you want it more, you must do it more. And it doesn't matter if it's this, or throwing money at these people, or bowing before them, or whatever. Or letting them sleep with your wife, or like some of these guys do, or whatever. Doesn't matter. It's always, give to me, give to me, give to me, and God will do this for you. Oh, I got to mention Perry Stone, because he teaches the same thing. In fact, he wrote a whole book, whole book on it, The Meal That Heals. Promotes this book, through and this is his own words. Through receiving daily communion, it is possible for a person to receive the threefold atoning work that Jesus did on the cross. Stop right here. You big, mustached liar. He's a liar. Through receiving daily communion, it is possible for a person to receive the threefold atoning work that Jesus did on the cross. He's a Catholic priest. Either that, which I don't believe. Or he has been fed somehow, some way, by a spirit or by a book he wrote or he read or something. Somebody taught him Catholic doctrine. Because it's the same thing. That you can't receive the grace and the work of the cross without the communion. And the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Not one word. You know what communion is for? Paul made it plain that we do show the Lord's death until he comes. That's all it is. It is not a gateway to receive miracles and grace and blessing from God. It's not. It never was. Until these jokers started, ma oh yeah, I'm, I'm angry. Through receiving daily communion, it is possible for a person to receive the threefold atoning work that Jesus did on the cross. It includes physical healing for the body, the healing of the human spirit, removing the sin and iniquity that is in a person's life, but also the healing of the emotions, the soul, and the mind. By receiving the Lord's Supper, you can have healing in, your, in every area of your life. And so it throws up this graphic on the screen. Why should you die before your time? Let me tell you something. You don't. Nobody does. That comes from Finnis Dake. I know where it comes from. I've read Finnis Dake because I had Finnis Dake brought into my church and I run them out. I run them out. I, I knew what it was. And I said, get out. You're not preaching that here. Finnis Dake believed that everybody should die about 120 years old like Moses did and not have any disease if you're really saved. See, he taught salvation to physical healing. And he said, if you're going to die as a Christian, you must die the way Moses did. No diseases, full life force, 120 years or somewhere around in there. But you cannot die of any disease whatsoever as a Christian. And if you do, obviously you're not saved. See, Finnis Dake had what's called repeated regeneration, where you got saved, you confessed your sin, God forgave your sin. But then you sinned again. Doesn't matter what it was. You lost your salvation right then and there. And no, free will Baptists don't even believe that. I was one of them for years. I know what they believe. They don't believe that. Every time you sin, you lose your salvation. You must get it back. That was preached from our pulpit. I'm going to let it happen once. That's why he says that. By the way, do you know what Finnis Dake died of? He wasn't 120. And he didn't, did, he didn't die with his full life force in him. He died of Parkinson's disease. Michael J. Fox has that. My former pastor here at Bethel, Pastor Goff, had that. His wife said he suffered horribly the last six months of his life. You're in agonizing pain the last few months of your life. Finnis Dake 
had Parkinson's disease, and according to Finnis Dake's own doctrine, he didn't have enough faith to drive it out. Therefore, he died without Christ, and he's in hell right now. So that's why Perry said, why should you die before your time? He believes Dake's doctrine. What is the greatest hindrance to receiving your healing? What should you do when Satan returns to your house? According to him and according to the book, The Meal That Heals, you should keep eating the Eucharist. Here's Paula White. Paula White now, Perry's promoting his book. He's on the Paula White Show, October 9th, 2004. And see, I tried to find the, the broadcast copy of Perry Stone's, because I watched it on per the Perry Stone Show on TV. I just happened to catch it, and I'm going, this guy's nuts. Years ago, you could find it on YouTube, but Perry's lawyers made sure that nobody puts Perry's teachings on YouTube because they want you to buy them. They want you to buy the DVDs, 50 bucks a pop, plus the book. Jokers. So he's on the Paula White show. You know, Paula White, Benny Hinn's girlfriend, Benny Hinn and Paula White holding hands going into a Vatican hotel because they're meeting with Vatican officials. That was when they were having their fling. Remember that? Paula White, I believe that as you take communion that there is protection through that blood. Did you hear what she said? She believes in transubstantiation. Then the Bible declares that the blood not only saves us, not only protects us, but it also provides for us. You said there's a couple that we know very dear that had a financial need. Perry Stone, yes, yeah, financial need. Ching! You get it? Paula White. And their father, a great pastor, Pastor Scott, told them God gave him a revelation. Yes. To take communion once a day. He said, take it every day, and as you're praying, thank God for blessing you financially. Thank him that... That's part of the provision. They needed $50,000 and they got an amazing, remarkable $50,000 miracle this couple did. Paula White, call that toll-free number. We want you to get the meal that heals. Paula White, Perry Stone, Paula White Show, October 9, 2004. See, it's moved in. And Perry, Perry Stone, TBN, that whole crowd, they number in the millions worldwide. Millions of people, non-Catholic people, now practicing Eucharistic adoration, just like the Catholics. Hebrews 13 addresses this exact issue, word for word. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. Leave all this stuff, people. Leave it. Bearing his reproach. Of course they're going to hate us. They always have. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I not only have no continuing city down here, which means country, nation. I have no continuing body down here. Do you think it really matters to me what disease I die from when I know that I'm going to die anyway and that when I die is never in my hands, it's in God's hands, and when I die, it will be the best Thing to ever happen to me. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise, not the sacrifice of the mass, 
to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know what the sacrifice of praise is? And I had somebody ask me about this. What is it that we, oh, I have to praise God and I don't want to. Is that it? No. Sacrifice of praise means you recognize that God is the one who has done everything for you. Not you because you kept eating wafers and drinking wine. See, that way you could be like Paula White and Perry Stone. You could praise yourself because you did it yourself. But when we recognize that the things that God has benefited us with, our salvation, our life, our families, any good thing, even the bad things that happen to us, those are for our benefit. That all those things that have happened to us, God is the one who did them to us. We didn't do anything for ourselves. That's when we cut out praising ourselves and we offer a sacrifice of praise unto God and God alone. He gets the glory not us. But you see, if you follow Paula, Perry, Pope, priest, pedophiles, if you follow all those P people, then you'll start believing what they believe. They praise and glorify. See, harlots say, look at me. Whereas saints say, behold him. If you want to follow all these people, you're going to boast to everybody. I take communion five times a day, every, like the Muslims do. They bow to Mecca five times a day, and they don't care who sees them. They ain't afraid of you. They roll their carpet out in the middle of the workplace and bow to Mecca five times a day, and they want you to see them. Oh, they, and you, when you start believing that you, if you, the more communion you eat, the more the more saved you're going to be and the more holy you're going to be and the more healed you're going to be. You're going to start telling everybody, well, when everybody says, man, you are such a, I see you a happy Christian all the time. It is because I eat communion five times a day. That's what you'll tell them. You won't tell them, I don't deserve it. I'm a poor, wretched, disgusting sinner. God should have thrown me in hell yesterday, but he didn't. You won't say that. You'll say, I take communion five times a day. Really? Does that work? Look at me. That's what a sacrifice of praise is all about. John 6. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Moses didn't give it. See, you're bragging. They were bragging. Our, Moses gave our fathers manna in the desert because they deserved it. Jesus said, you bunch of liars. But my father gave you the true bread from heaven. For the, true, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 1 Corinthians 10, 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Was he talking about the water and the manna? No. He was talking about the words that the Lord said to them. Because they, see, they drank the water that came from the rock, didn't they? And did that water have special miracle powers that enabled them to live beyond the 40 years they were in the desert? No, every one of them died drinking that water and eating that manna. Only two people, Joshua and Caleb, who ate the spiritual food, the words that the Lord said to them and drank the spiritual water, the words that the Lord said to them. They believed it and they were the only two who didn't die in the wilderness. Do you get it now? It was never supposed to be, you do this, then maybe God might, might forgive you for the next 
I don't know, as long as that's in your stomach. It was never about that. It was always about this. And the sooner you get a hold of that, the better off you're going to be. Done. This is Pastor Mike. Four, five, six teachings on this one subject to get this point across to you. It is grace alone and not of works. You're the reason why I do what I do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.